Hello, good evening, and welcome to Hardfire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and we're here for another half hour of scintillating, we hope, libertarian conversation and debate. With me tonight is uh, Audrey Dussard, CPA, um, member of Dussard Walker and Associates, also an adjunct professor at uh, Long Island University. And um, she and I will be discussing the issue of taxation and just how much of your income is taxable, how much of it ought to be taxable. And um, joining us over the telephone is author Peter Hendrickson. He has written a book called Cracking the Code, The Fascinating Truth About Taxation in America. So, uh, Mr. Hendrickson, I'd like to start with you. What is the fascinating truth about taxation in America? Well, the fascinating element of it, uh, Joseph, is that it is, uh, as uh, implemented and as uh, the law is written, it is entirely constitutional. Uh, I know a lot of people who have read uh, portions of the Constitution, particularly Article 1, Section 9, where we have that uh, interesting limitation on direct taxation, uh, except by apportionment, uh, might have wondered about that, uh, looking at the way the income tax appears to be administered. But the fact is that when one looks deep enough into the actual statutory structure of that tax, one discovers that it is uh, completely in accordance with the, uh, with the provisions of the Constitution. It is not a direct tax. It is an indirect excise tax. It is applied exclusively to the exercise of uh, federal privilege. And, well, you're talking uh, about the personal income tax, correct? I'm about the personal income tax and the corporate income tax, for that matter. Okay. Um, Ms. Dussard, what do you have to say about that? Is he right? Well, and what I'd like to know, uh, if, um, if that question is a little bit, bit too abstruse for us, is why, um, why is the personal income tax in const unconstitutional if it is, in fact, written into the Constitution? There was a separate amendment specifically pr providing for a personal income tax. Now, morally, I'm opposed to it, but the fact remains it is in the Constitution. Therefore, how can it be unconstitutional? Well, the, the, the fact is the 16th Amendment was a, merely a minor modification of a tax that had already been in place for some 50 years prior to the passage of that, uh, of that amendment. Uh, the 16th simply provided that the, uh, 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 the loophole that the Pollock Court acknowledged in Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust in, uh, in 1894, in which the uh, persons whose uh, dividends were being taxed argued that to tax a dividend is to tax the stock property from which the dividend is derived, thus constituting a tax on that personal property and therefore requiring apportionment. Okay. That's maybe, that's maybe a little bit too complicated for some of our listeners, so I'm just going to cut to the chase and ask Ms. Dussard, uh, if I was to walk into your office and say, I don't want to pay personal income tax, I want you to find me a way where I can legally not pay personal income tax, there's what would you tell me? There's absolutely no way not to uh, pay personal income taxes. That's the Constitution. It says taxes can, uh, individuals can be taxed on their personal wages. There's no way to avoid paying personal income taxes. No, no, uh, can I... No disagreement here. If one, if one receives income, one is taxable on that income. No question about it. The real issue is, what is income? Okay. Uh, income is income from anywhere. Any type of income from any source, uh, Pete. But well, uh, we, can't, we can't define a term by using the term itself. Uh, uh, so please, please define it using other terms. Do you mean that all earnings constitute income under the law? All earnings constitute income under the law, under the 16th Amendment. I mean, that was the, that's the... The 16th Amendment doesn't say anything about earnings. That's it the, says, that all, it but, says that all income can be taxed. But that's the express purpose of the 16th Amendment. You mention it as a minor amendment, but it's, it's not minor. That was the purpose. I think Ms. Dussard is trying to say that, um, that uh, wages or earnings... Uh, certainly are income. Isn't that what you're saying? Exactly. And uh, Mr. Hendrickson, you're saying that they are not? Why are they not? I'm, I'm saying that, that certain kinds of earnings, certain kinds of receipts are indeed income. Income is a constitutional term. It's a defined legal term. It doesn't mean all that comes in. It doesn't mean money. It means something specific. It means the benefit of the exercise of a federal prerogative measured by the dollars brought in through that exercise. Uh, the Supreme Court has ruled on this repeatedly. Uh, this can be found in the nature in the in the statutes themselves. 
Uh, and the 16th Amendment by no means was the income tax amendment. The income tax was in the movie, uh, instituted in 1862, actually in 1861, but it was essentially replaced in its entirety in 1862. And the vast bulk of, well, not the vast bulk, but a significant portion of what we know as the Internal Revenue Code today is a reflection of laws passed well before the 16th Amendment was passed. Okay. The 16th Amendment was a, was a, a, a as I said, a, it was a, a minor modification intended to bring the coupon clipping class under the umbrella of taxation when and if their earnings constituted income as that term is legally defined. Okay. So uh, that, um, that being the case, Mr. Hendrickson, if I came to you and said, I don't want to pay income tax, how do I get out of it? What would you tell me? I would say, see to it that your earnings don't constitute income, which is to say, see to it that your earnings are not uh, uh, connected to the federal government. And how do you do that? Well, it's easy. I, if most people that work in the private sector, their earnings have nothing whatsoever to do with the exercise of a federal prerogative and therefore don't constitute income. Their earnings don't constitute wages. Uh, wages being also a defined term in the law, by the way, and I'm sure Mr. Starr is very uh, familiar with that fact. Well, uh, Mr. Starr, is he right about that? He's Absolutely incorrect. Uh, Pete, what would you say to Joseph when the IRS comes calling, say, hey, where's your income? What would you, how would you help jo Joseph out? Well, if, if Joseph had not actually earned any income, if he had not received any income, uh, the IRS will not come calling. Okay, but, but the fact is that I do receive money at any rate. For example, I am a private businessman. I have clients who pay me fees to do things for them. Um, now, is that is that income or is it not income? Well, it depends on this on the on its source. It depends on the nature of those clients and the nature of the work you do. Uh, my guess is it probably does not constitute income. And why wouldn't it? Well, because again, in, income means the ex the exercise of a federal prerogative measured by the dollars produced through that exercise. It does not mean money. There is no tax on money, nor can, nor can there be. Think about this. For a minute. We. Uh, your ability to engage in commerce, your ability to contract with other people to to uh, trade your your uh, your services for money predates the existence of the federal government. It predates the existence of the state governments. In fact, it predates the existence of any form of government. It is a fundamental right, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the government. Uh, the the government is not in a position to claim a piece of that action. It has nothing to do with it whatsoever any more than it can claim a piece of the action for your uh, uh, breathing air. or Okay, well now morally, morally, Mr. Hendrickson, I would agree with you, but uh, the, the fact is that... The, the, the fact is, though, Joseph, that the law reflects that principle uh, but, very explicitly. But morally, don't cut it, uh, nor, does, nor does my interpretation of the law or your interpretation of the law cut it. If the government wants to put you in jail for not giving them money, they can and they will do it. Isn't that right, Ms. Dussard? That's absolutely, absolutely correct. Oh, that, I, I agree 100 percent. They will if indeed one has, has failed to pay a tax when one has actually received income. But again, income does not mean all that comes in. The Supreme Court has said so very explicitly. In fact, it said so, it said so in, on many occasions. Okay, well, um, Ms. Dussard, he is giving us a, uh, a defini definition of income that I hadn't really thought about. Um, is, is he right? And if so, uh, can I do anything about it? He's incorrect. What do you understand by a cash basis taxpayer, Pete? I'm sorry, could you repeat what, that? What do you understand by cash basis? A cash basis. Uh -huh. You said there's no tax on cash. What do you understand by a cash basis taxpayer? Yes, I understand. You're, you're, you're discussing a nuance of the Internal Revenue Code. It's not one that actually has an application to, to most people. We're not talking about a basis issue here. And I'm not making any kind of suggestion that that one uh, can argue a basis in their labor or anything like that. I if, think one, if, one is, if one is selling one for, to the federal government, if one has signed a civil service agreement or taken a civil service test, one's labor is certainly, or the, the compensation for one's labor certainly is taxable. But if one has not done that, one's outside of that uh, entire basis structure uh, from the get-go. As the Supreme Court has said in, uh, in South Pacific v. Lowell, for instance, we must reject the broad contention submitted on behalf of the government that all receipts, everything that comes in, are income. Uh, it's just not the fact. Everything that comes in is not income. That's the common usage of the word, of a homonym, for the legal term income, but they're, they're not the same thing. 
Can I ask you where you get your legal facts from, Pete? Uh, are, you, are you a lawyer? No, I'm not a lawyer. But I'm are a you lawyer. an expert in constitution law? Uh, some would say so. I've, I've written pretty extensively on the subject, and I've studied it uh, uh, fairly extensively. Are you I studied? Might, I, might I might point out that, uh, that readers of my book have uh, received several million dollars back over the last several years in entire refunds of everything that had been withheld from them money that had been levied from them, money that was garnished from them by governments, both federal and state governments across the country, and that is an ongoing process. I myself am the first American in history to have received a complete refund of all Social Security and Medicare uh, taken from me over the course of several years now. Uh, these well, are facts that kind of that sounds great. Time. How do I do it? Well, read my book. Okay. Um, you um, um, have to tell our uh, listeners how they can get a hold of this book. Is it something that's readily available, say, at Barnes & Noble? Uh, Barnes & Noble, Borders, uh, the bookstore chains won't touch it with a 20-foot pole. It's, uh, it's uh, I think, a little too radioactive for them. But uh, uh, it is available at LostHorizons.com. Uh, it's also available on Amazon. Okay. Well, uh, wh why wouldn't they buy it? I think that they view it as a, as a, a kind of controversial subject. Uh, well, but my goodness, uh, you can buy controversial books at Barnes & Nobles, of course, if you want to go into the poetry section and buy a v volume of Bukowski's poetry. You'll find that it's hidden at the back. You have to ask for it like it was pornography or something. But the fact is that you can get controversial books at Barnes & Nobles. Um, Ms. Dussard, why do you suppose that uh, they wouldn't carry his book? As he said, it's controversial. I myself tried to get a copy there, and they just didn't have it. Uh, maybe it's not important enough for them to carry it. Maybe uh, it would not be... Well, now, is this the first you've heard of Mr. Hendrickson's uh, contentions? Haven't anybody, hasn't anybody come to you and said, I don't think that what um, the government says is income is, in fact, income for taxation purposes? I've been hearing this argument for years, and I wish I could believe them. I wish, I, I mean, maybe they're right. But what are the implications of their argument? Uh, Pete just spoke about the individuals who have received refunds. Yes, refunds are automatic, Pete, but how are you going to help these oh. people when the IRS starts sending them notices? Uh, and, uh, these are not automatic refunds. These are, in many cases, refunds that are vetted through five and six different IRS staffers. Uh, in fact, if you go to my website, you'll, you'll see uh, not only the refund checks, but in, in many cases, the entire file documents and the many, many correspondences back and forth, from signed well, correspondences, I might add, from well, IRS personnel handling these uh, refunds. Uh, some of them very complicated uh, in their uh, histories. And uh, it's, it's kind of uh, 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 an inevitable factor, I suppose, that many people that, that were initial readers of this book are people who had long histories of complicated relations with. Okay, the, uh, the very good. But uh, let me ask you this, Mr. Hendrickson. Let me ask you this. Um, <clears throat> these people are maybe getting refunds, but is that the last they are going to hear of it? Uh, can, can you promise that they are not going to have the IRS or the police or whoever pounding on their door at some point saying, hey, pal, you thought it was over? Think again. I, I can't promise anything because I can't, of course, be 100% conversant with the, uh, the details of any individual's circumstances. Uh, I can say in my own case, uh, uh, I'm several years uh, uh, into uh, uh, acting on the knowledge that is conveyed in my book, of course, and uh, have been entirely left alone. Uh, in fact, the only, the only contact that I've had with the federal government uh, over the last several years has been three independent efforts on the part of the IRS to investigate me for promotion of an abusive tax shelter, which is kind of their catch-all uh, censorship uh, gimmick. Uh, on each of those three occasions, the Department of Justice withdrew support from these IRS enforcement efforts and asked uh, for uh, my cooperation in their dismissing these uh, enforcement actions. So I'd say that, uh, that I can speak with some confidence that uh, someone who, who uh, acts in accordance with the law uh, will, will gain the benefits of the law. Okay, well now, uh, Ms. Dussard, you, uh, you are the president-elect, I understand, of the Brooklyn chapter of the New York State Society of CPAs. So you know a lot of other accountants, I would assume. Oh, yes. And does this subject ever come up amongst your uh, fellow accountants? And are there any of them you've met who have said uh, more or less what Mr. Hendrickson is saying? Never. I've n never broached the topic with any of my uh, colleagues because it's totally unimportant. Can I ask Pete what his readership is? 
I'm sorry, sir. Can I ask what your readership is? Uh, How many people yeah, have read well, your books? In, in terms of, of uh, uh, raw book sales, well, now uh, we'll... it's about 10,000 at this point. Uh, the book was almost immediately uh, pirated and uh, scanned and, and put, uh, made available in a digital format by people in Estonia and Canada. And so it's impossible for me to say uh, how many have read it uh, in one fashion or another. Well, maybe it's a blow to your pocketbook, but I'm sure you must be flattered by that. And in any case, uh, I, I have to point out that uh, how well a book sells is no indication of whether or not it contains the truth. No, no, that's absolutely the case. And, and, and frankly, you know, in two years' time, uh, 10,000 copies is actually pretty good for, uh, for a, a book that's never seen the inside of a bookstore. It's entirely a word-of-mouth sales. I also might point out that my website, uh, which contains uh, the bulk of the uh, raw information, not nearly as, as uh, handily uh, absorbed, I'm afraid, but, but that bulk of that information uh, takes about a million and a half hits a month at this point, and uh, well over a million documents are downloaded from it every month. Okay. So the word is certainly getting out. Okay, and speaking of websites, I'm just going to uh, break away from this topic for a moment and uh, remind our viewers that if you want to know more about libertarianism and the Libertarian Party, I suggest that you visit the um, website of the Manhattan chapter of the Libertarian Party, which is www.manhattanlp.org. And um, uh, there you will find um, links to the um, National Libertarian Party, to uh, other libertarian websites, and um, to um, various uh, bits of information about libertarianism in general. I would also remind you that the um, Manhattan Chapter's annual convention is coming up on Saturday, January 21st. And if you want to attend that, all you have to do is go to our website and find out the details. That is www.manhattanlp.org. And now back to the fray. Um, Audrey Dussard, we have been listening to Mr. Hendrickson saying that uh, a lot of uh, what a person is earning is actually not income for tax purposes. Now, whether or not that's true, is there, are there certain types of earnings uh, whether, or types of monies that you receive uh, during the course of the year that a lot of people pay taxes on that they ought not to be paying taxes on? Not my clients. Uh, my my uh, responsibility is to have my tax my clients adhere to the tax laws and pay as little taxes as possible. I avail myself or I avail them of all the deductions available uh, to minimize their tax liabilities. But, I, don't uh, that, I don't doubt that that's the case for a moment. I think that the, the if I can be allowed, uh, Joseph, I think that the question really was: uh, Would you acknowledge that there are earnings? that people can receive that are not, that don't constitute income, as that term is meant in the law. And um, do you, in fact, feel that way? Uh, can you repeat that, Pete? I'm sorry, I got yes. distracted a bit. Would you agree that there are forms of receipts that Americans can have that do not constitute income, as that term is meant in the law? Well, yeah, proceeds from insurance policies, death benefits from insurance policies are not taxable. But there's very little income. I mean, that's not, that does not constitute income. Therefore, it's not taxable. But I can't think of any element of income that is not taxable, Pete. Okay. Well, I agree. No, 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 I agree. But you keep using the same word to define itself, uh, uh, Audrey. Uh, all forms of income are taxable. You and I are in 100% agreement on that front. Okay. Uh, what I'm asking about is earnings or receipts, things what's, that... What's uh, the difference between earnings and income? Well, that's the key to the whole shooting match here. Uh, so you're saying, you're saying, Mr. Hendrickson, basically that uh, income can only be defined as uh, money that you earn by working for the government? Well, or, or in connection with the exercise of a federal prerogative. Certainly uh, investment income, uh, dividends and so forth that are paid from investment in a federal corporation constitutes income as well. In fact, I'll, I'll give you my, uh, my uh, uh, brief a summary of what constitutes income. Uh, remuneration or benefits, either immediate or deferred, paid by the federal government, its agencies, instrumentalities, and I'm going to say state government. Okay, state I understand you so far. You have, to, you have to read the book to understand why state is in quotes. 
and the proceeds of and from federal corporations and instrumentality uh, and the proceeds of and from the conduct of a trader business. Trader business also being in quotes because it's a defined term in the law. It doesn't mean owning a gas station or being a plumber. Uh, it's defined in the law as the, as the uh, performance of the functions of a public office. Okay. So it's entirely consistent with all of the other legal aspects of oh. income and the tax on income. Okay, well now as a, as a private businessman, I am the uh, principal of a, uh, of a corporation and uh, our clients might include uh, Company X. So Company X pays us, say, $10,000 for this or that service. As long as that company is not affiliated with the federal government, you're saying that that $10,000 that they pay me is not income and I need not pay tax on it. Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't, I don't tell any individual specifically whether their particular earnings or their particular receipts are or aren't, because frankly, I can't know all the details of somebody's circumstances. Uh, what I will say is that if there is no exercise of a federal prerogative involved in those activities, then it would not meet the definition of income. Okay. Well, uh, now, he, he does make a, um, a very interesting distinction and one that I for one, was not aware of. Have you heard this uh, distinction before, Ms. Uh, Dussar, in uh, all of your career as an accountant? No, I've just heard it from the tax prote protesters. That's not the position of accountants, yeah, my right. colleagues, no. Well, uh, should, shouldn't it be? Why should it be? Why should we break the law? Uh, but shouldn't, uh, don't you think you have a, a duty to your clients to say that uh, the, it's the government that is, in fact, breaking the law and that uh, if you want to you to the law, you should in fact not pay taxes and insist that the federal government observe that law. How can I say that? I don't know that. Uh, Mr. Hendrickson has been saying that, but I'm not sure he even knows that. He may be right. But remember, he's... So he's will you go to, uh, to a, uh, some person whom you consider qualified and ask him if Mr. Hendrickson might be correct? Uh, shouldn't every I, accountant do that? I don't know. I'd have to read the Constitution through and through myself. I mean, remember, the Constitution is a very concise document, and the principles are generally stated, and it's wide open to interpretation. How does well, Mr. Hendrickson come about with his interpretations of the Constitution and what's taxable well, and what's not taxable? I'm not interpreting the Constitution. Uh, well, you uh, said taxes are illegal according to the Constitution. Isn't that what you said? I, I said they're entirely legal. They're entirely constitutional. The structure that we have, the current income tax structure, is entirely constitutional. Yes. So, um, so uh, what, what he's saying is that there is a distinction between the word income as we tend to define it in everyday speech and income as it is defined for purposes of taxation. Is that not what you're saying, Mr. Hendrickson? That, that is precisely correct. Not only a, a distinction of that sort, but also uh, other key defined terms in the law that have homonym uh, reflections in common speech are wages, employee, employer, trader of business, uh, self-employment. Uh, all of these terms are actually formally defined terms. They have definitions specifically in the law that are unique and are distinct from the common words that are of the same, have the same appearance that we use in everyday speech. Uh, it is axiomatic that a term that is defined in the law does not have its common meaning. That's why there's a definition provided. Uh, it is a fundamental of statutory construction that when a definition is provided, it means nothing but what it, how it is defined. And all of those things are indeed defined, and those definitions are entirely consistent with the structure of the tax as a tax on the exercise of a federal privilege. Ms. Dussar, you're looking as though you don't, disagree, you don't agree with him entirely. Yeah, because he's completely ignoring the 16th Amendment. The express purpose of the 16th Amendment was to make income taxes uh, income taxable. No, no, so why totally you said it's a minor amendment? It's not a minor amendment. There was a purpose for it. Well, there's a purpose for everything. There's a purpose for committing murder, for heaven's sake. But, uh, but the question is, and and he's not questioning. I don't think the constitutionality of taxing income. I think that what he is contending is the definition of the word income. Um, and uh, ought this not to? Yes. No, but let, me, let me read what the Supreme Court said when it was asked to rule on the meaning of the 16th Amendment in the uh, Bruce Schaefer case, uh, which was the first case it took up on this subject after the passage of that amendment. It said, we are of the opinion, however, 
that the confusion is not inherent, but rather arises from the conclusion that the 16th Amendment provides for a hitherto unknown power of taxation, that is, a power to levy an income tax which, although direct, should not be subject to the regulation of apportionment applicable to all other direct taxes. And the far-reaching effect of this erroneous assumption will be made clear by generalizing the many contentions advanced and arguments that support it. And it goes on for a while. Then, but it clearly results that the proposition and the contentions under it, if acceded to, would cause one provision of the Constitution to destroy another. That's a reference to the Article I, Section 9 prohibition on a direct tax without apportionment. That is, they would result in bringing the provisions of the amendment exempting a direct tax from apportionment into irreconcilable conflict with the general requirement that all direct taxes be apportioned. And the court said they did not do this because the 16th Amendment was an in, or a relatively minor modification on the existing tax. Its sole purpose was to defuse or close the loophole that the Pollock Court had opened in the existing income tax in 1894. Okay, now that's all well and fine, Mr. Hendrickson, but if that is the case, why haven't we seen more litigation on this issue? And why hasn't Ms. Dussard ever had a client come to her and say, you know something, I don't think I should be paying taxes on my wages. Can you do something about it? Well, and I'll, I'll tell you why that is, is the case. For one thing, there was litigation. The Supreme Court ruled strongly uh, and frequently on this subject at the time, around the time the 16th was passed. Between 1913 and 1920 or thereabouts, there were a series of rulings, many rulings on this subject. From that time forward, the court concluded quite correctly they didn't have dealt with this subject, and there wasn't much else that needed to be done. Uh, at the same time, several generations of, of, of Americans were born and died at the time that a broad expansion of this tax was attempted under the, the current Tax Payment Act of 1943 and the Victory Tax Act uh, in 1942. Uh, during the time of World War II, suddenly, whereas it sounds pretty despicable to me, and uh, we're going to have to wrap up on that note, I'm afraid. And Ms. Dussar, I hope that you will uh, consult with some of your colleagues and maybe with some tax lawyers and maybe uh, join in uh, Mr. Hendrickson's fight to uh, put an end to uh, unlawful taxation. And on that note, I'm going to have to wrap it up and say good night. Tune in next week for another edition of Hard Fire.